I open this academic session in which Mr. Kupunga will defend the academic thesis development of the caudal part of the human embryo. I welcome, of course, the candidate, the candidate and the panims and uh, lots of success. I also welcome uh, Dr. Vyoshat Tiyunaku, Professor Lamas, Dr. Hicks, Post, and Professor Cooler, the supervisors, and of course, the opponents, but you will meet them later, and everybody here in the room and online. First of all, we give you a 15 minutes time to present what you have done in your thesis. Thank you, Prorector. Dear Prorector, member of the Corona family, friend and colleague, and also my student, both here in Maastricht and online from YouTube. So in next 15 minutes, I will give you a summary of my thesis entitled Development of the Caudal Part of the Human Embryos. First of all, I would like to introduce to you about the gaps to fulfill the understanding of developmental anatomy. Let's start with the first one, the intermediate step. So imagine that you're jumping on the stair, that is the description of the developmental processes. So they normally start at the step zero, that is the progenitor cells. And then they normally show the definitive structure or the adult structure. In between, you can see that there is a gap that you can fall. So it means that you can, it can lead to misunderstanding of developmental concept. So in this study, I try to increase the intermediate step to better understanding of developmental concepts. Moreover, the surrounding tissue also include only few structure, for example, in gut development, they normally include the abdominal artery. So as you know that the gut tube is the second brain, where is the nerve? Nerve should be taken into an account to describe the gut development also. So in this study, I increase the number of the intermediate step, also increase in the surrounding tissue, for example, ganglionic cells, nerve fiber that we can identify by their staining property. And also we also extend to the caudal part of the body because there was no comprehensive model which allows the developmental dynamics of the human embryos. So we would like, or we expect that we try to build a better stair for developmental process of the gut development. So before I begin my uh, presentation, I would like to introduce you about the color code that we will use throughout this talk. The first one is the artery that is will be in red, and then the gut tube in gray. For the gangrene cell, it will be various color of the blue. We have blue and also purple. Moreover, we also have the nerve fiber series that will be in yellow to the sand color. For the spinal nerve that is yellow, sympathetic trunk will be in orange and the spanic nerve will be in sand color. So let us start with the simple question. Where is the caudal region? So in this study from the extrinsic innovation of the gut tube, I can separate the development into two parts. So the border that separates these two parts is the bifurcation of the umbilical artery. Moreover, if I adding the hip bone into an account, so these caudal part to the bifurcation of the umbilical artery is the lesser pelvis region. So in this talk, I will talk about the extrinsic innovation of the gut tube. I will have a scheme also uh, on the right hand side on the slide. So start with the neural tube and then they have some extension of the spinal nerve in yellow. You have the aorta in red, the gut tube with their intrinsic nerve. And I also have the ganglionic cell in blue. So for the extrinsic innovation, it can be separated into three steps. The first one is the migration of progenitor cells. And then these progenitor cells aggregate to form the sympathetic trunk. And also some of them migrate further ventally. Lastly, the last step, they, the, the extrinsic innovation connected with the intrinsic system of the gut tube. So let's start with the first step, that is the migration of progenitor cell. 
as you can see on the screen here, this one represents the area that I will talk. So if the, the upper part of the embryo is right, it is I talking about the tolerable abdominal part. But if the lower part is right, so I talking about the rest of pelvis. So from this picture, you can see that uh, the ganglion cell indicated by blue arrow uh, is, is phenotypically and topographically similar to the neural crest cells here. So this neural crest cell migrate from the neural tube toward the retinal side of the aorta, pala aortically. Moreover, there is also the second population that we call it Schwann cell precursor. This Schwann cell precursor migrate along the spinal nerve that you can see here clearly that they wrapping around the spinal nerve in or, uh, yellow. So this cell migrate uh, to the lateral side of the aorta using the spinal nerve as a bridge. And then after the migration of these two progenitor cells, there is the nerve extension medially to the lateral side of the aorta following the root of the gangrenic cells that we call the communicating branches. So let's move to the lesser pelvis. In lesser pelvis, there is also the gangrenic cells here found lateral to the, the, the median sacral artery, the caudal extension of the aorta in the lesser pelvis. So this cell also migrate pala aortically to the lateral side of the aorta, but in this region, this gangrenic cell expand ventrally toward the gut tube, different from the, the cranial part. So to compare these two cranial and caudal part, so in the tolical abdominal cavity, the gangrenic cell migrate pala aortically, but with the nerve following as the communicating branches. In contrast, the pelvic part, the gangrenic cell also migrate uh, pala aortically, but then they expand ventrally without any nerve extension like the communicating, the communicating branches in the cranial counterpart. So after that, this is the second step. Some of gangrenic cell aggregate into the sympathetic ganglion and also contain the nerve fiber in orange here. This collectively called sympathetic trunk. If I include the aorta and also the vertebral column and follow between five and 10 weeks of development and separate the sympathetic trunk into two parts according to the bifurcation of the umbilical artery here. So I can separate into cranial and caudal part. So let's focus on the cranial part first. So the cranial part, the sympathetic trunk start at the lateral side of the aorta. So we call it pala aortic position. And then uh, during between five to 10 weeks, these sympathetic trunk relatively move dorsally to the lateral side of the vertebral column that we call it this way here. We call it pala vertebral position. So for the caudal part, initially they start at the the same position, the para aortic lateral to the uh, median sacral artery, the extension of the aorta. But this part remain at the same position. So you can see that it remain lateral to the median sacral artery, but then they also in front of the vertebral column that also called pre-vertebral region. So some of uh, gangrenic cell that aggregate into sympathetic trunk, but some of them also migrate further ventrally with the extension of the nerve fiber that we call is splenic nerve or the ventral plexus. For the Schwann cell precursor derived gangrenic cells, they aggregate into this organ, uh, in, uh, incorporate with this organ, the adrenal gland in brow. So to form the adrenal medulla and also 
to become paraganglion. That's the biggest cluster known as the organ of Sukhakan at the area of the inferior mesenteric artery. And then for the neural crest cell derived gangrenic cells, they mainly aggregate into the origin of the celiac trunk that we call it pa-aortic plexus. So let's move to the caudal part. So the caudal part after the ventral expansion, so these uh, these gangrenic cells separate apart to form two cluster of gangrenic cells. The ventral cluster, we call it inferior hypogastric gangrenic cluster. And the dorsal one, we call it sympathetic trunk. For the inferior hypogastric gangrenic cluster, they receive two nerve fiber from the cranial system, that is the hypogastric nerve. And they also receive the nerve fiber extend medially from the sacral spinal nerve here to the inferior hypogastric gangrenic cluster as known as the pelvic spanglic nerve. After that, sacral spinal nerve also gives nerve extension here to connect with the sympathetic trunk in orange to form the communicating branches. And then at the sympathetic trunk here, they give the nerve fiber ventrally to connect with the inferior hypogastric plexus that we call sacral spanglic nerve. So for this step, uh, the aggregation of the sympathetic trunk and the ventral migration in the cranial, uh, in the cranial cortical part, they start at the area of sympathetic trunk and then ventrally extend to the gut region. In contrast, for the pelvic cavity, they start and separate from the gut region and also the sympathetic region before these two regions connected to each other. Lastly, this is the third step, that is the connection of the extrinsic system and intrinsic system of the gut tube. These connections start at the level of the celiac trunk by the vagus nerve that show you in the orange here connected with the nerve fiber in sand color that extend and wrapping around the celiac trunk. So this one is the first connection of the extrinsic and intrinsic innovation. After that, during the mid gut herniation state, when the mid gut loop also protrude extra abdominally, this one is the mid gut part. If I zoom in here and see from the top view, so you can see that the extrinsic nerve in sand color here extend along the superior mesenteric artery in red here and uh, connected to the intrinsic system at the cecum and also the first loop of the mid gut. Moreover, at this state, at the level of the high gut, there is also the connection of the extrinsic system here and the intrinsic system in the fluorescent green. So in both above and below the bifurcation of the umbilical artery, there is the connection here. Lastly, after the mid gut loop uh, come back intra-abdominally, only the part that is the ductal part of the mid gut, there is no nerve, no extrinsic nerve extend along the superior mesenteric artery that you can see this is the free nerve area. So this, this top part of the mid gut will be the proximal part of the last intestine. So to conclude uh, our finding, you can see that in the cranial part, the gangrenic cells start and migrate from the sympathetic region leads to the gut region. And following with the nerve fiber almost uh, immediately after the migration of gangrenic cells. But in contrast, in the lesser pelvis, the migration of the gangrenic cells start to finish first at the area of the gut tube before the nerve extend around one or two days and to complete this system is around one week or two weeks. So in conclusion of this part, the extrinsic innovation of both abdomen and the lesser pelvis 
it is topographically similar but uh, differ chronologically. So from our study, we can export our 3D model as a 3D PDF that you can rotate and see, investigate digitally. If you would like to see the 3D PDF, you can see in the digital version of my thesis or download directly from the journal article that you can see that we can also uh, hide the structure to see inside the 3D model. And I also printed the 3D model physically by 3D printer for my students to export. They can palpate and take, uh, feel the texture of embryonic structure to feel better understanding of developmental concept rather than using the classical presentation. So finally, I would like to thank many people throughout this journey. And lastly, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This concludes the lecture two days. Now we start the opposition. Now we have the chair of the assessment committee. That's, uh, we start with the uh, opposition with the chair of the assessment committee. That's Professor Jonkers. She's professor in intestinal health and nutrient of the Maastricht University. And she has also accepted the role of secretary today, for which I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you with a really beautiful thesis. Uh, it is really well written uh, and you combine studies to get further insight into the developmental uh, anatomy, but also uh, building uh, models for educational purposes. And I was also now again impressed at the really the nice illustrations you have to try to, to uh, uh, show the, the uh, developmental anatomy uh, over there, and also appreciated the fact that all your manuscripts have been published and are well appreciated by peers, as I noticed by the award also. Also, congratulations to your team. Uh, uh, you, it, it's not my area of expertise, but I learned a lot. It was really interesting, and I would like to go a little bit further to chapter two and to see if you can um, explain to me a bit further on how you did build this model. I also saw, already saw your staircase uh, there, and you had uh, a lot of historical embryos uh, available for analysis. And then you did, did scan and align uh, uh, the sections. You had to re remove some noise, try to identify landmarks. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on on how accurate that is, and was there some vari variability which may have impacted your findings? Can you uh, discuss that a bit further? So, dear yeah, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your appreci appreciation with my thesis. So, for the 3D reconstruction, we have the histolo historical collection from Amsterdam, Leiden, Nijmegen, and also Göttingen to have our, to have the serial section, and then we digitalize the serial section by slice scanners. So, and then they export this part into the JPEG file. And after we have this, this file, we import into the 3D program that we histologically analyze the serial section and make the boundary of each structure that mm -hmm. is our area of interest. Mm -hmm. And then the computer will build the 3D model for you. For the accuracy, we also have to check with another collection in the same age to check whether this finding is true yeah. or is it just variation. So that we also check and we also check with the literature because sometimes some people, some researcher also did the molecular study with mice or any kind of animal. Yeah. So that we also check the the, yeah. the, the development yeah. and compare with it, that yeah. one also. Yeah, but I, I was just wondering, because you had these nine landmarks you uh, identified, and, and did you then uh, identify them manually, or was it also by computer? And is there some inter-observer variation there, or is that not playing a role? So actually, uh, for the reconstruction, we ha I have to uh, make the boundary by mm -hmm. myself first, and yep. then we discuss with my team if it's uh, reasonable or is it 
correct or not mm-hmm. that that we 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 have the intra we we have also interpersonal check for for this one. Okay, you you check that. And then I was also wondering because it is a historical selection of embryos. You already said that you checked it, so it's really nice to hear. But I was just wondering um, because those embryos are available for for a reason. Uh, could that have uh, are they representative for the normal situation? Could that have impacted your results, or do you what do you think about that? So actually, that also not the normal concern, but. We, we have checked the structure also uh, for author's embryo to check our embryo is normal or abnormal. That may be only the, the way that we, we can do, mm-hmm. but also just check the, the structure also inside the embryo itself, because if there is some problem with, with embryo, so you can see some malformation inside the embryo mm-hmm. also. Oh, no, it's really, really nice that you took that uh, uh, yeah. into account. And uh, it's really nice to, to learn from these kind of uh, models and, you know, really looked at it from an anatomical point of view. Uh, if you would have a lot of money left, how would you further extend your model? Would you be interested to add additional uh, stainings or markers or what What would you like to go for? Uh, actually, for, for, for my part, I actually extend the study into the head and neck region because for now we talking about the pelvic region that mm-hmm. also like a hinge point of the embryo, but the cranial part also less attention because like you have a stair, they just have the progenitor cell and okay. that is the muscle. So I extend that part also to, yeah. to you- better understanding yeah. of uh, development. Can I ask one short question? Yes. Yeah, short so, question, short answer. Yeah, so would you also be interested to, to add, for example, molecular markers, proteins or gene expression? So that part... You can just be, say yes or no, then, then I'm happy. For me, for me, no, because it is impossible in Thailand, because in Thailand, the human embryo is ethical, ethically concerned. Yeah, okay. that I cannot okay. get the new one. I understand. Thank you very much for your answers. I give the word back to the co-rector. Thank you, Professor Jonkers. I don't know if the guests online can see us. We don't have a video uh, connection, so we have to see how that goes. But the Padel is asked to see if we can do something about it. The second opponent is in any case on site, and he's also a member of the assessment committee. And that is uh, Professor Timmermans. He's professor in cell biology and histology in the University of Antwerpen. And thank you very much, Professor Timmermans, for coming all the way from Antwerpen. The University of Maastricht is always pleased to receive guests from outside. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, dear Mr. Kupunga, as I already stated in my written comment, I was really impressed uh, by your work and the amount of work that you uh, presented and particularly with the material on the 3D uh, interactive uh, files, uh, which indeed allow a much better understanding and which has also certainly relevance for the students. Um, And of course, as already said, most of your work has been published, has been already peer reviewed. So uh, I think that's also a guarantee that it is of high quality. Nevertheless, I have not made the trip from Antwerp to Maastricht not to ask you some questions is the reason why I have to play a role as opponent. And I do have some questions. Um, so my first question also relates to chapter two, and perhaps there were some other questions also by the other opponents to that chapter. It was a very popular chapter. Um, you were mentioning there that, um, of course, there is the, the still the uh, uh, controversial issues around the uh, subdivision of the cloaca into the pure genital and anorectal uh, passages. Uh, so in your finding, your main finding was that there are pronounced differences in growth between the uh, rapidly expanding central and ventral parts, whereas the cranial and dorsal parts are very slowly in growth or even do not grow. So what might be, could you elaborate a little bit on the possible mechanism? Because a very quick literature search learned me that, uh, that there's at least in terms of the cell replication rate in that region, that's very similar to human and mouse. So of course you already allocated to the limitations in 
human samples, but but what kind of mechanisms which have been studied in mouse would also be or might be involved in in the human. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your com compliment. And uh, your question is that why the dorsal part or the mechanism that related to the differential growth on the dorsal side. So if you see on the graph, it actually for the ventral side, it grow like the embryonic embryo at, at large. So only the dorsal side stop or just slowly grow in, in terms of that one. So I have read the article about the, the apoptosis marker. They have the apoptosis apoptotic marker surrounding that dorsal part in mice, I guess. I, I, I cannot uh, specifically sure for, for that one, but there is someone did the, the research about the apoptotic marker. So if you have apoptotic marker control at that area, so that part just permitted to grow, differ from the ventral side that the marker operability marker is Increased. Okay, and it, is there is it in combination with proliferation or just? So it means it actually there is also the proliferative marker there, but you have also the combination of the apoptotic marker. So at that region, you have both proliferative and apoptotic uh, situation at the same time. So the growth in net is just about zero or just flat. Okay, thank you. My other question relates to chapter three and also chapter four a little bit. Um, regarding your, your definition of the extrinsic component of the um, gut innervation of the enteric nervous system, um, I do appreciate that you added a, a note in, in the proof, yeah? because at first glance, when I was reading your, your work, um, you very clearly um, elaborated on the efferent part of the extrinsic component, but almost neglected the afferent or sensory part. Was there a special reason to do that? Uh, or uh, because is there also a difference in timing? Because you do see regional differences in the timing of the migration of these neural crest cells. Of course, you mainly focus on neural crest derived cells. There's of course also part of the um, extrinsic sensory component, part of them, the, the spinal ones, the dorsal root ganglia are of course also neural crest cell derived, but the other ones in the dose, for instance, are neurogenic black hole derived. Do you see any, or did you look at any differences in timing between the afferent and, ex and efferent components? And the reason why I ask that, because nowadays, if we look at different um, gastrointestinal disorders, uh, there might be more wrong with the efferent component than with, than with the efferent component. Uh, thank you. Do uh, you mean that the why I did not include the, the sensory yeah. or what is the sensory in, in this, this part? Because actually for, for my uh, 3D reconstruction, we based on the standard uh, standing. So we cannot distinguish between this the sensory or this is the, uh, the motor or the, the autonomic nerve fiber. So that part, it could be if, if there is study by molecular marker in, in human embryo that can adding more uh, uh, information in, in this part. But I also read the article that, that is in the proof Actually, the route of the migration is quite similar, but only the timeline is a bit different. But I'm not so sure they look at the ganglionic cells or, or not. And the question remains yeah. whether it's really translational to the human situation, yeah. of course. Eh? Still have time or time is up? Okay, time is up. Thank you very much for your position, Professor Tim Manzer, for keeping the time. Um, then we come to the third opponent, and uh, he's also a member of the assessment committee. That's Professor Thibault, and he's a professor of research in intensive care in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. He's online, but thank you for coming uh, from Rotterdam. I'll be online.
for an welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pro Rector. I hope that everybody can hear me. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a real privilege to contribute to this uh, thesis defense. And I'd like to congratulate you, Mr. Candidate, and your uh, team with this real, very impressive effort. It also brings me back a rather emotional to the start of my own career when I was uh, writing my thesis on the chicken embryo gut development. And at that time, I didn't realize that we know so less about the human embryo. So let me take you to chapter two, in which you say that uh, the, uh, this, the uh, posterior part of the cloaca ruptures around 6.5 weeks of development. And what are your thoughts about what is this rupture? Is it cell necrosis? Uh, did you identify pycnotic uh, nuclei? How is the mechanism that sometimes this ruptures and sometimes it's not? And would that be then the uh, cause of an anorectal malformation? But let's start with what do you mean by rupture? So dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, compliment. So you mean that why the posterior coagal membrane rupture? So for the mechanism, actually, we don't know exactly uh, what happened with, with the rupture, but our meaning of the rupture is that uh, the, the, end, the end of the cloaca is open and that that was uh, what term the rupture in in that opinion. Mm -hmm. But this is then an active process. Uh, we cannot say the active necrosis, or because we have no marker to confirm the necrosis or apoptosis or any or, or any cell death during the rupture of the coagal membrane. I understand that because it's one of the restrictions, obviously, of this uh, human embryo investigation. But I still would like to uh, provoke a little bit. So what would be your ID then? So is this active cell death or, and, and when it doesn't work, is this then the cause of an anorectal malformation? Uh, so you asked about what is my idea for for this rupture? Yeah. So it can. So if I, I'm not so sure if uh, the the researcher that did the the apoptotic marker, they also have the apoptotic marker around that area. If mm -hmm. I just I I include that one into an account, it may be that they actively apoptotic. Uh, apoptotic dead in, in this term, but that is just my opinion. If we would like to confirm, we have to do the experiment or stay in the marker for, for that part. Yeah, and would that be then, uh, if you would work with genetic mice strains, who would be selected on having an anorectal malformation? Would that be an approach that would help you in understanding? Yes, of course. If, if we can genetically modify the gene or tag the, the, the staining with this kind of the malformation that we can answer. Yes, I agree well, so, with, with so you. Let, let me go then a little bit into the clinic. Maybe you are aware that in the uh, anorectal malformations that newborns are born with, there is a huge variability. Some have just a covered anus, while others do have a very extensive anorectal malformation, incorporating also the uh, urogenital tract, even including the kidney sometimes. So if I would hypothesize that the variability in anorectal malformations is due to a difference in time during this embryonic process. What do you think about that? I, I cannot hear the word that 
what what is your opinion again no my, my question clear. is <clears throat> if the timing of the event is different in the embryo do you think that that would be the reason why there is so much variability in anorectal malformations so if you have an early event you get a high anorectal malformation if you have a late event then you have a rather simple anorectal malformation or is this too simply ah uh, okay so in in my opinion actually i did uh, i i explained the normal development but what we can uh, hypothesize we can actually don't know exactly what happened during the anorectal malformation but if the regulation of the dorsal part of the cloaca is not well regulated in various time so that can cause the various level of the anorectal malformation the connection from the high gut part or the the digestive passage to the urogenital passage will be higher up during very earlier development so mm -hmm. that that is only uh my opinion so, but you have to understand that i'm also here to learn from you you are the expert and so i'm raising a question of which i don't know the answer either so uh, i think, I think my time, time is over is it? thank you very much professor tibul for your opposition and then we come now to the following opponent and that is professor Mohamed. He's a professor in pediatric surgery in the University of Maastricht. And uh, Professor Gemert, the floor is yours. Esteemed candidates, first of all, my congratulations to you and your team with a very interesting and high quality uh, thesis. And uh, actually, I'm a surgeon, so I am very visually oriented. So I'm very happy with the 3D uh, concepts. Uh, to understand the, the development better. So since I am a, a, a pediatric surgeon to be, to be exact, uh, my interest lies in the link between um, anatom anatomical development and um, clinical disorders and their treatment. So actually you, you made a, a proposition about that. That is proposition number nine. Maybe one of your parents can Read it. <laughs> um, realistic images and accounts of embryonic development improve medical students and doctors' comprehension and may well improve surgical outcomes as well. Thank you. So my question is quite simple and general. So um, uh, normally when and I'm a surgeon, I'm my starting point is the adult anatomy uh, when the anatomy is finished so we try to restore it uh, so i was wondering if you can elaborate and explain to me uh, why a detailed embryological knowledge can help me with surgical treatment and outcome and maybe name some examples dear highly esteemed opponent thank you for your enjoy with my 3d models so for what uh, the surgical outcome that is actually what we would like to to extend our study also but but not that far but for the surgical anatomy for example anorectal malformation they normally just uh, i i i don't i don't know if it is applied here or not so you normally just pull the digestive passage or to open and at the axis of anus, but if you know uh, extensive model of embryo, for example, the nerve supply or the muscle related to that part, you may uh, increase the viability or make the functional uh, of your surgery better than you just understand the classical concept. Yeah. 
Okay. Then I would, I would uh, like to ask you um, some questions about um, mainly chapter three, about the um, development of the intrinsic innovation of abdominal intestines. And I was very interested by the fact that, uh, what you also told in the presentation, that the development of the innovation actually stops or delays at the umbilical level. So, so the the the, the um, um, part of the, uh, the bowel which is outside yeah. the, the abdominal wall, um, um, the, end of the development starts when it retracts with, within the abdomen. Yeah. So I um, I was we have some some disorders we see quite commonly uh, with abdominal uh, effects and rotational uh, malrotation, which are omphalocele and gastroschisis, zum Beispiel. Um, for example, um, so by um, in omphalocele, the there's still a peritoneal coverage yeah. of the bowel. In gastroschisis, it's not. Yeah. What we see, what is amazing in these small children is it, also with the giant omphalocele, it's amazing that it's it's working. Mm -hmm. So the the bowel has peristalsis, and these children normally can drink normal and have defecation. Okay, in gastroschisis it's different. So it uh, very often uh, takes a lot of weeks, some even uh, mm -hmm. months, uh, for them to work properly. Can you explain that from an embryological point of view? Uh -huh. For my point of view for the oncolocele, because you just uh, that the I, I I'm not so sure the theory nowadays is is changed or not. But they just because the the gut tube cannot pulling back inside your abdomen, so everything just covered. So it looks it seems like the normal situation, except only it extra abdominally. So uh, the factor that related or regulate the extension of the nerve fiber maybe can still available for the gut development, also functional development of the nerve fiber. But for the gastrochysis, it is the, uh, the, the, the malformation of your ventral body wall. So they just export your, the gut tube outside. So it can be that they lack of the blood vessel that could be the, the, the route for the nerve extension or the area that send the signal to extend the functional development of the gut tube itself also. That could be okay. the idea. One of the things and uh, uh, discussions we have in gastroschisis, should we um, let them be born prematurely by sexual? Uh, mm -hmm. We know when they are born sooner, uh, the, the function will be uh, uh, restored quicker. So we think it's because the, these bowels lie in amniotic fluid and they don't like it. They get a mm -hmm. kind of serositis kind of picture. But uh, when we operate them sooner, we don't see that. And they uh, restore functionality much faster. So mm -hmm. can you explain that with the same mechanism? Uh, for that part, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with that part because I, I never see it. But going on with with, with yeah. that these two, I just know from to be very directly, and you can have a very short answer. Is uh, um, is it possible uh, that the um, development of the nerves can uh, also go um, uh, beyond when they are born and when they are born prematurely and still develop or it, restore? It it could be if if the surrounding structure can send the signal. That could be they can keep the functional development. Yeah, that that's what I I think. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Professor Hamet, for your opposition. Now we come to the following opponent, who was also a member of the assessment committee, and that's Dr. Melotte, and her field of interest is entric nervous system and colorectal cancer in the department of pathology. Dr. Thank Melot. You. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, also I want to congratulate you with this nice thesis. I must say I'm always impressed by researchers studying embryology because I think it's very complex and even combine it with these fancy 
3D models makes it more complex. So congratulations also to your uh, promotion team. You write in your last um, proposition, the place where you can be yourself is yours. I'm sure with this promotion team, you felt very at home. <laughs> so um, I shared my Google, I study the intrinsic ENS. So um, I was very intrigued by your first sentence in chapter three, where you write that you focus on the intrinsic ENS because you say the intrinsic ENS is very well described and documented. Uh, to be honest, and I think Professor Timmerman also agrees with me. We were on an ENS meeting uh, two weeks ago, and we still, yeah, we still really, really try to understand the intrinsic ENS. So, where do you base uh, your comment on that it's very well defined? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, joyful with my with my fancy 3D models. <laughs> so, for for that comment, because I try to find the the article for the extrinsic innovation, but they actually said in about the Waco neural press migration along the gut two, that is the intrinsic innovation, but it's very rare to find the, the the development of the extrinsic innovation because actually nowadays they normally use the marker and also with some migration of the neural crest cell that is very popular issue, but the nerve fiber, I don't know why or so, but that, that is my opinion. Yeah, so really based on literature, literature yeah. search. Okay, yeah, so yeah, but I think you also yeah, agree with me that we still have to learn things. And yeah, as I already mentioned today that we also, there are new articles coming out for single cell sequencing and molecular markers. And you said in Thailand, ah, I don't have the possibility to, yeah, get embryos to study this, but maybe you can study it from the literature. And if you read that literature and you would find other interesting things, I was wondering how flexible is the model that you now show to change these things? Because I, I assume if you want to use it for educational purposes, it has to be flexible to change and to stay up to date. So how flexible is it? Uh, so actually our 3D model just is the reconstruction from the Cinema 4D that is the program that you can uh, make a change for 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 the model. If we have another uh, study that okay, it should be connected with that one. We actually can adapt our model to uh, very flexible for 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 the new finding. Because so you could act at like easily a next step for a step. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Actually, because. Firstly, I, I start at the cloaca, and then I study the extrinsic innovation, but I also share the same uh, gut tube. So you can, if you have more information, you can add more, but it should be realistic study to make the model very comprehensive for the student also. Yeah. I understand. And also, yeah, going further on this model, it's also mentioned already, for example, I'm interested in neuropathies, uh, Hirschsprung disease. Like if you, I know probably you don't find embryos with Hirschsprung uh, or it will be hard to define up front, I guess, but um, could you learn from mouse models or um, zebrafish models with Hirschsprung or other neuropathies and compare this with you, your models? Uh, is that something you could use in educational purposes? So actually uh, for Hirschsprung disease, uh, I try to uh, reconstruct also that you can see in my slide that we try to make the fluorescent green, that is the intrinsic part. But we have only, we can only show where you have no connection of the extrinsic nerve. But if you have the mouse, but the translation from mouse or Ciba fish should be very accurate because structure can be different. For example, the liver. They, 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 there is also the difference uh, between the human and also the, the mouse. But if we have a uh, very precise uh, finding, we can just translate these findings to the human embryo also. Yeah, and also maybe build a model for hair from disease. Yeah, and then, yeah, last question, like um, you showed us 3D printed. Why are they white? I would like to have uh -huh. them color. <laughs> so because actually our printer is 
cheaper than the colorful <laughs> printer. If you have colorful printer, it's you can you can print it. But we have this one is the resin, so it it a bit harder. But we cannot print it on on the multiple color. But if you would like to have color, you can paint it. But it's difficult also if it is the nerve. I I try once, but yeah. just give up. Yeah. yeah, but that is something that you could aim for in the future. Yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. Really if helps. we have the printer, because nowadays the printer, uh, the technology of 3D printer also allow you to print uh, with multiple color, but it's very expensive. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if that's time for the last question. Certainly, short question, okay. short answer. Yeah, I hope short question. Like um, something also what intrigued me is the difference that you see in the location. Uh, of the gutter, the different nerves, and you also see it in the adult, uh, yeah, in the humans. Um, the, I thought it was because of the microbiome, microbiome uh, influences the colonization of the bird. But what do you think about like what is triggering this? Short, mm. Yeah, short answer. <laughs> Sorry. So actually, I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not family. I I heard the term microbiome, but I haven't uh, read it before about how it can affect. The development or not, it could be, but it's not. Uh, I cannot claim it here because I don't know actually. Okay, no, thank you for your answers, and I get word back to the project. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Milot, for the uh, opposition. And then we come to the following opponent, and that's uh, Dr. Heller. His field of expertise is anatomy in the Institute of the Department of Anatomy and Embryology in the University of Mr. Dr. Heller. Mr. Kuiponga, dear candidate, um, thank you for this really nice book. I learned a lot and uh, was really triggered to it. And uh, to be honest, I was caught by chapter five. And uh, the sympathetic system, and especially page number 128. And uh, my question, or my first question, into that direction you say you see the first communicating fibers in the level of T3, T4, or 2, 3, sorry. No, 3, 4, that's correct. Why there? Mm. <laughs> Dear uh, esteemed opponent, yeah. thank you for your question. So, because actually for the sympathetic connection, it, it is, there is the communicating branches uh, at the thoracic level as almost the first, uh, let's say, wait, can I just, uh, so it is normally it's along that, that region, the, t, uh, the thoracolumbar outflow that is for the communicating branch that can exist. That's why they start at that level. And above you have uh, the brachial plexus that maybe they uh, inhibit the, the, the extension okay. of, of okay. the communicating branches, but that is just in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Why I ask is because uh, I was thinking that everything is running, running in a chronological manner where the first parts develop and the first cells migrate outside that they are the first communicating what uh, develop. That was my idea, but yeah, I go with yours. And then you say later on, you even see communicating branches up to C1, C2. Mm -hmm. And although we only say uh, in educational uh, level, we say that uh, the sympathetic trunk is only building from C8, T1 and not C1, to C7. Mm. How so, can you explain that? So it could be that uh, actually uh, there is the nerve fiber in, in that term that connects to the sympathetic trunk. We define that is the communicating branches, but mm. actually we don't know exactly they go in which direction. Okay. It can be go in different direction, but we can say only this is the connection. So that could be uh, uh, the compromise between the classical model and this fighting mm -hmm. because we don't know the direction of the nerve fiber actually. Mm -hmm. And then running downwards, you say you um, go down to sacral four 
and uh, then now this big discussion starts that again we say our sympathetic level is running down to l3 and not further and building from there and that uh, how or start the other way or add another question to it um, how can you distinguish parasympathetic and sympathetic ganglia because vagus innovation down to transverse colon. So descending colon downwards must be another parasympathetic innovation. How can you distinguish now ganglia downwards, down uh, more caudally between sympathetic and parasympathetic? Or is there a difference? <laughs> so you mean that uh, how I can distinguish between sympathetic nerve fiber or ganglionic cells and parasympathetic system? So to be honest, for this one, we cannot answer mm -hmm. for which one is sympathetic and which one is parasympathetic because we use only the uh, very standard staining that available for serial section. So if you have the study in, in the real human with, with specific markers, so you can answer. But for, for my study, I cannot. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we may state that the more caudally is a mixture maybe yeah. of both. And uh, further on, all of this is page 128. Yeah, <laughs> really nice, uh, or to me, the most triggering page uh, in that chapter. chapter. Then you say that uh, the, you find connection between the sympathetic trunk and ganglion nodosum, meaning vagal nerve and that upper part then okay you state later on the sympathetic connection of the splanchnic nerve to the celiac uh, trunk which is sympathetic fiber uh, parasympathetic so um, how uh, did you see anything in between the interconnection sympathetic parasympathetic uh, for for that part we only see the nerve fiber from the sympathetic trunk connected with the Vagus nerve, but for the vagus nerve connected, how how they connect with this part, we have not yet for reconstructed this this part completely. So I cannot answer what step should be for this connection for sympathetic and parasympathetic because we have to study more in detail. Because you describe here something which has been forgotten for sixty seven years to be named the sympathetic parasympathetic interaction, which has been in textbooks for yeah 70 years ago, then diminished. And now you come again and bring it back. So that's nice. One question now to education. Education and your really scientific uh, research are two different things. How, because education is uh, simplifying. How can you transfer your things to education. Have you any ideas what to do in between? Not only print them, uh -huh. how to make them more readable, understandable? Yeah, for my experience as a lecturer, I try to make the solid line first for each, each, each lecture on whiteboard to see the connection of the story. I, I did not follow the textbook but I try to make everything new to, to make this student more understandable. You, you may finish if you want. So that, that can cause a uh, student more, more clear development because I cannot throw or bombard student by, by data that I, I have found, but I just simplify by scheme or by Best storyline. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Heller, for your opposition. And uh, Mr. Kuapunga, the time appointed for the defense of your thesis has passed, and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations. And I'll return in this room and uh, for those online, stay online, we will be back and I suspend this meeting.
I reopen this academic session. Mr. Kuangpunga, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense, and in view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Köhler is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times? Please use the microphone. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. And by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Nutmete Kroepunga, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. I would like to thank Dr. Vatana and Dr. Somluk that they made it possible for you to come here to Maastricht to do your master thesis. Dear Nak, dear Dr. Krupunga, I'm very honored to stand here today as your co-promoter especially as you're my first PhD student. This means that this day is not only a landmark in your career, but also a landmark in mine. In September 2015, you started your journey as a PhD student in Maastricht, more than 9,000 kilometers away from your hometown, Bangkok in Thailand. It was the first time you left your home, which definitely must have been a challenge. However, this did not slow you. From the first moment you set foot in our department, your enthusiasm was obvious. You were enormously motivated to start with your research. And for that, I also would like to say thank you to your family in supporting you anytime, everywhere. We got to know you as a very committed colleague who enjoyed to figure out the missing pieces of the embryonic puzzle. From the very start, we engaged in-depth discussions during our weekly research meetings. It was a pleasure for me to guide you in mastering our 2D software, and I'm very proud to have played my part in your route to success. During your PhD, we had many discussions on how to visualize a certain aspect, the human anatomy, in the best way possible. 
So therefore, the most beautiful schemes were made because you have a very keen eye for color and aesthetic. A talent we also were able to enjoy today. <laughs> um, also during your PhD, you organized your work through placing post-its on our office wall everywhere. And I can tell you this immense colorful collection of posters did not only reflect your organizational skills, but could as easily be passed out as a piece of modern art. <laughs> Besides work, you learned to cook and enjoyed weekly dinner also with other Thai students living in Maastricht. But especially the cooking was highly relevant as I think almost 10 kilograms were lost in the very first <laughs> beginning that you arrived here in Maastricht. On the cultural side, you also visited, visited virtually every city in the Netherlands, probably even more than myself that you have seen from the Netherlands, but also the major cities in Europe you have seen. You went to Brussels, Paris, Pisa, Florence, uh, Rome, Barcelona, London, and probably I'm <laughs> forgetting many more. And I heard already you go back to Paris one of these weeks that you are here in the Netherlands. So probably that was your most favorite one then. Also in each city, you checked for the most artistic cookie or cakes. But in my opinion, the Dutch Stroopwafel was your favorite. And not only yours, but your family's favorite too. Because each time you could visit your family, you exported also Stroopwafels to Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> and next to the traveling, you also enjoy shopping, but then specifically shopping for sneakers, of which the most colorful examples have passed our eyes. Next to shoes, you also have a passion for books that fuel your insight in human anatomy and embryology. I never thought there were so many books on visualizing human anatomy from different perspectives. And I'm sure this collection will be an invaluable addition to your library in Thailand. During your stay in our department, we also went to the annual Dutch anatomy meetings where you immediately won the poster prize. Next to that, also your first article published entitled the development of the cloaca was awarded as best anatomical paper of the year. And not only once, because your article in 2021 on the extrinsic innovation of the abdominal intestine was as well awarded as best paper of the year. So this reflects the ground and paradigm breaking quality of the research you did during your PhD. Your enthusiasm, organizational skill, and insight into the human anatomy have brought you to this day and continue, hopefully or probably also to be the driving force in your further career. I'm very proud also to see that in the short time that you were back in Thailand, you were able to set up your own 3D lab with your colleagues and perform their 3D embryology in the combination with students or teaching students this amazing topic. The use of our models together with the 3D prints will prove to be invaluable in furthering the world's insights in development of anatomy. As far as the distance between our home tongues may seem, the distance between our passion and drive for embryology is zero. I wholeheartedly hope that we can enjoy a long lasting collaboration between our departments. I will be able to continue breaking paradigms in the field of embryology and neurological anatomy with our innovative theory on differential. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Gio. Thank you, Dr. Hicks for this now nice laudation. And uh, dear Dr. Kuapunga, uh, also on behalf of the Board of Deans and the University of Maastricht, I congratulate you with this uh, very well done promotion, PhD. And uh, also I congratulate your uh, family and friends, of course, and your supervisors, Professor Kurder, Dr. Hicks, Professor Lamas, and Dr. Leracha Tianuko. I hope you have a great day and probably you can celebrate it here and later on in Thailand. Uh, I want to thank the opponents for their coming on site and online. Um, and of course, the Padel and Luke Peters and Joshua Fafelu to make this hybrid uh, academic session possible. I'm always, I'm now almost at the point of uh, uh, ending this ceremony, but I have to tell you that we are going to be, stay here for another photo. I ask the audience to already leave. You can wait in the uh, rafter where the reception will be, because then we go and make a picture on the stairs, and then we will join you at the rafters. And uh, so I can ask you to leave. Uh, only the photographers can stay, of course. And having said that, 
I close the meeting. Thank you.